Jared Pappas Kelly is a lecturer, an artist, an author, and one of the keener minds I've ever came across. He was polite enough to spare a part of his day to come on and talk with me and Charlie about his latest writings and how lockdown has affected the university's efficiencies to teach art. I would like to thank Jared for coming on and talking to us, and I'd like to thank you for listening, so please enjoy. How has lockdown been treating you, Jared? Uh, it's been okay. It's been a bit stressful, actually. But I've, I've been getting some work done, which is nice. Yeah. So. Uh, me and Charlie have just How about been, you? We, we've just been doing this. We haven't really been doing any work. My, my, my other work game's opening back up, but I haven't been brought in luckily yet, so I'm still on furlough, which I, which I enjoy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. Is Greg's opening? Yeah, we've, done, up, we've done nothing. No, well, Greg's is opening on... Greg's is opening supposed to be... I think they're opening tomorrow for training on the lockdown um, measures or whatever, so everyone has to be two feet apart. But I don't get how it's going to work because ever, at Greg's, everyone stood on top of each other anyway. So yeah, they're supposed to be opening yeah. on Wednesday, but I've managed to blag that I should be off until July. So around the 1st of July, I'll be going back. Did you see all the queues today for pre-mark? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I, I saw walked, that. I walked through today, and honestly, it, it, it's as if, as if lockdown has been like, Turned off. It's just over, like, yeah. Rammed, yeah. There's a lot Did of things. Ha- ha- there was a there was a sign for for spots direct for like a four hour queue or something like that. Really? So it was like the have it at Disneyland where it's like if you yeah, hear, much, yeah. <laughs> at this yeah. Point, yeah. Can you get the <laughs> fast pass or whatever it is to yeah. go through quicker? <laughs> That'd be good. But you'd make a lot of money off that. <laughs> yeah. I might tell customers privilege me. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> what have you been doing during uh, lockdown, then, Jared? You know, uh. Well, I have a book that is coming out in the beginning of August, which you know about, and I've been finishing up another book I was working on, and doing a bit of art, reading a bunch, and I've still been teaching from remotely, which has been a bit stressful, but gotten a fair amount done. Yeah. Is this the MAs or the BA? Uh, The MA just started, the, the BA... Uh, we just wrapped up marking and everything. So yeah, yeah. Is it easier to teach the MAs or the BAs on the on the online? Uh, they're all being taught online, both MA and BA. So no, I'm saying which one, which is more stressful? Oh, uh, probably probably the BA, just because there's more of them. Yeah. <laughs> Have you been so reading, any, reading talk, anything yeah. interesting at the moment, Jared? Um, I've been reading just kind of stuff that I don't normally read. I read uh, the Three Body Problem, which is like Chinese science fiction. That sounds and, good. Yeah, it was good. And I um, just finished, um, what was it called? Uh, Children of Ruin, which is uh, Adrian Tchaikovsky. He's an English science fiction writer. And he, it's kind of like evolutionary science fiction. Oh, yeah, that, that does sound good. I, I yeah. d- downloaded like um, a master file of loads of books in my Kindle, but I haven't got around to, around to reading any of them. I, I just I I've got a subscription to Audible, so I've just been downloading audio books. Oh lately. yeah, but I, well, that's I, nice. Just I keep on downloading books way above my intellectual level, and then <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. I have no you idea. What's, don't understand what's going on. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I downloaded a Nietzsche book. I just like I can't I can't follow it. It puts me yeah. To sleep, you though. definitely have to be in the right headspace to sit down with Nietzsche. Yeah, yeah. Especially because wow. it's it's when I'm going to bed and I put my headphones on, I just drift away. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that works too. <laughs> Um, Do you want to tell us a bit about your book, Jared? I tell you about my book. Uh, it's yeah. called uh, "To Build a House That Never Ceased," and uh, it's basically a collection of my writings for like the past fifteen years, all put together. It's uh, it's uh, mostly interviews. There's some stuff that was around. A lot of it's stuff that was meant to go into my last book, which was "Solvent Form: Art and Destruction," and so it was like the 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 rough bits that never quite made it in, but a lot of it's a lot more accessible, I think. So it's a, a good way to get into what I write about, and what I think without having to grind through something like solvent form. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's a lot more accessible, as you said. So someone like yeah. me might be able to understand I was gonna it. Say, yeah. So Stein can read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stein can read it. Yeah, uh, that, that it's got a bunch up. of different stuff in it. It's Hopefully there's something that kind of appeals to anyone. And I don't think you necessarily have to sit down and read it from, front cover to back i think it's more you you kind of dip in and find essays or interviews or bits that sound interesting to you yeah that's a, that's that's um very handy because um often i'll like start a book and get like 30 pages in and then uh, yeah. give up and i'll never read it again 
But if yeah, there's yeah. just certain parts of it that um, obviously I was interested in, then I'd, I'd just read them parts. So that yeah, makes, that yeah makes exactly. Sense. Yeah, so I don't think it's anything more than the Wikipedia page in the sense of like, if someone needs to find out certain information or a certain quote type thing from you, they can find it easier. It's not a glossary, um, Charlie. It doesn't have a glossary. Uh, I didn't have a glossary. Very kind of but, together, you know I mean, but... like in the sense of like, <laughs> I suppose yeah, it's glossary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a conversation. You could just ask me those questions, and I'll, I'll tell you the answers. Does it have a glossary? <laughs> Sorry, what was that, Charlie? Uh, he, just, he just said, "Does it have, have a glossary?" That's it. Well, but no. I mean, in the sense of you designed it so it just sort of like you don't have to read it like from like page to page. You can just jump to certain sections. That's actually the next book I'm working, or not the very next book, but the next book that's my art book I'm working on is meant to be just like you open it and you read a page or two, and that's kind yeah. of how it's, it's designed. But this one, it's it, I wrote it, and it's it's basically stuff from all my archive stuff or things I've written for magazines over the years and things mm. that are just kind of hard to find all put in one place, plus all the, the initial material that goes into the last book and a bit of the stuff that goes into the next book. And that, it, the idea is that you can just kind of, nothing's that long. You can kind of just read through it. Something's mm-hmm. going to hopefully be interesting to you or something will stand out to you. And I, oh, I also wrote it, I put it together in reverse chronological order. Right. So it, I, I start out smart and I get dumber as you go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? So, what's that? Why did you do it that way? Because I thought it was kind of related to my previous book. And so it was kind of good to start there. Yeah. And then there's there's like interviews I I worked on when Michael and I were doing projects years ago, and there's some early like reviews and things like that. That it's just kind of a different. It comes from a different place than the current stuff, and so mm-hmm. I figured that if people want to read it. It was it was in there, but is this stuff that like be hard to find online? Yeah, yeah, it's stuff that's just it may not be in print anymore, or it was written yeah. for like small magazines, or it was online, but not all in one place. Oh, yeah. What gave the idea to do it? Oh, was um, it free time in lockdown? Or... <laughs> a bit of the free time in lockdown. I was approached <laughs> by uh, a publisher that wanted me to do something like this. So I yeah, cool. said, we, sure. We forget often, Charlie, that Jared isn't proper academic. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how was your... Um, you were starting a, a publishing company yourself, weren't you, Jared? How was that coming along? Is that... Um... Uh, yeah, it's going really well. It's Invert Extant is the publisher. I I designed the logo. Just just yeah in. yeah. Stein designed the logo. <laughs> I've actually gotten nice compliments on that logo. That's nah, so all right. Don't be very about very proud. <laughs> and what else? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm editing two books right now for it, and I'm also just starting a new project where I'm going to start publishing. I want to talk to different artists and have them talk about their work in their own words. Because right. I feel like a lot of times we kind of get in the habit of reading about it in a magazine or seeing something that's pre- already being mediated or presented to us in some way. So it's kind of nice to see what someone has to say about it, about their own stuff and the pieces of work they're doing. So that will feature on the, the online portion of the website for Invert Extant, but it will also become part of a book eventually. Have you got like a deadline or like a date for when you want to be like on the ground type of thing or... yeah yeah everything's in place it was supposed to start publishing the beginning of next year like everything mm-hmm. was gonna be ready to do then i'm kind of waiting a little bit to see what happens after lockdown yeah and things like that but uh we'll be publishing stuff next year cool that's good that's good, that's good. yeah that's definitely um progress <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you want so this is the second book in a year. Is that is that true? Uh, it came out in twenty nineteen. The last one, the solvent, with the solvent one. Sorry, oh, was yeah, that... solvent form. Yeah, that came out twenty nineteen, like in February. So, like a year and four months or something like that. It's, it's really impressive. That yeah, I, I I've only read two books in the pa- in the past year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, in your life. yeah, writing them. <laughs> well, if you've read two, then now you just have to write two, and you'll be fine. I, I could I could try. <laughs> it wouldn't be it wouldn't be very good. Uh, could do design based work or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, as a um, prom- prominent fine art academic. Would you argue that artists' writing in theory is more important today than um, practical and physical work? Um, is writing in theory more important than physical work? Is art theory more important than physical work in the like the current climate? Type? Yeah. Is words more important than physical 
Or... I don't know. I don't. I think maybe I would say no. I think that the work always comes first. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're working in critique and things like that, I think it starts to get into this world where it's almost kind of like vampiric, vampiric. I can't say the word vampiric. I guess that would be how you'd say it. Where mm-hmm. it's kind of you need the work first, and then there's kind of this whole level of people who just kind of suck the energy off of them. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's not really what I'm interested in. I, I think the work comes first. I think that ideas are very important for making work now. Maybe, maybe more so than in the past because we're kind of in a post-conceptual world yeah. where everything is kind of idea-driven or in that sense. I also think that when I write my books, I'm actually doing visual art. For me, mm-hmm. that's how I think about it. I don't really separate between my, my video work or the drawing stuff I do because especially the next book that's coming out, which is called Stalking America. Ooh. It's it's very much, <laughs> yeah, it's timely. It's very much <laughs> though, like you're reading it and it, I'm thinking of almost like conceptual art where it's happening inside the, the reader's brain. Yeah, all right, yeah. And that's... I don't know how successful it is at that, but that's kind of the intention for it. So yeah. well, we'll see. It's very interesting. So that, that's a, little, that's a um... thing that definitely a book does obviously take place inside of the reader's brain because yeah. that's why people are disappointed when they watch movies and everything's different yeah. to how they imagined it. It's kind of the original virtual reality in a way because you really were creating the world in your brain. It's sure. And if you look at conceptual art, a lot of that stuff was originally meant to be galleries but were in the forms of books or the forms of instructions inside of a book. So visual art, there's a, there's a connection to that as well as just the, the history of reading a book in general. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> you just blew Stein's mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little about a little bit about the the book you were thinking about making after the one that you're publishing? The are you talking about book? Stalking America? Yeah. 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 Stalking America is it's kind of autobiographical. It's kind of fiction. I keep saying it's a fake memoir, but it's it's sort of about all the unimportant stuff on a journey Mm -hmm. like the stuff that's not storytelling the weird sitting on a train waiting for things to happen sort of overhearing other people on the train and their conversations Mm -hmm. and if you're on this train for like a like five days at a time kind of thing you would start sort of living with these pieces of text that are or audio that are always coming over to you Mm -hmm. and so you kind of create your own little world out of all these different like the the space between places yeah yeah kind of yeah and it's also like There's a lot of historical stuff thrown in, but the main character is, I think he's like 17. And so he's basically, he kind of thinks he's an expert and he's kind of making these grand Mm -hmm. decisions about things, but it's also a kid. So he doesn't really, it's not, he doesn't really get it all the time. We've all been there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So it is a narrative story. So it's like a written... Sorry? It, It is a narrative story. It's a narrative story and then it has a beginning and an end. Right. A lot of it's just sort of atmosphere yeah yeah that makes that makes sense what were you saying charlie i was gonna say is it more like of an audio version of people watching yeah kind of well it's a text space but yeah it's kind of like the experience of people watching or the experience of how when you're out in the world and a little piece of this conversation a little piece of that a little bit of something you see out the window all kind of your brain wants to put them together and so it sort of makes up these stories that may or may not be true just because that's what you have in front of you. Yeah. And there's a there's a whole part of your brain that's sort of the part that um, it's when your brain's not doing anything, it engages your brain and it starts working more actively. I, was, but it's yeah, sort of like, I can't remember I was listening, uh, listening about last, that um, humans are meant to be bored. And because yeah, we're not yeah. bored anymore, because we're using our phones all the time yeah. and um, stuff like this, we're not, we're not thinking as much when, when previously we had that time to think. To decompress to and, and put things together. Like it's how you create your own history, how you sort of think about what's around you, create hierarchies and that kind of stuff. But they're also, I was just reading, there's studies with it that um, with autism, they're one of the things that they believe is that maybe people aren't able to do that. They're, that part of the brain isn't as developed or developed differently. And right. so that's one of the things that gives autistic behavior. Like they don't, they don't have that part in their daily routine. Mm. Uh, and I don't know if that's true or not, but I also think it's interesting. I think how different brains form differently and, and how we create meaning differently. And that's, that's kind of, as an artist, that's what's important to me. It's good. It's good. It's definitely some of my, my favorite memories are just traveling just on my own. Yeah. It's just the, 
being inside your own head. You do make up your own yeah. narratives as you. As yeah. You. Well, well, you get out of all the the crap that's like your daily life. Yeah. And so the things that seem really important and stressful when you go on a trip somewhere, they just sort of go away. Yeah. Or you can at least sideline them for a while. And so it's all these new things, and you kind of get to create new relationships with what's there and what you see, and and what it's almost like COVID nineteen in a way. When I first was on lockdown, there were a lot of stresses and a lot of things that seemed really, really important. And then by this point, I've prioritized a bit different than than how I did before. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I yeah. think I've got like a prisoner mentality of COVID nineteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where I, I can't go back out into the real world now. <laughs> are you getting yeah? Are you getting agoraphobic yeah, and everything? I'm climatized <laughs> to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm always kind of already wired to be a bit of a homebody and on my own so it, it maybe brings out the bad tendencies of me that <laughs> <laughs> i just want to live in a little dark room but who knows oh yeah it's it's been like the most positive time it, like for my sort of physical and mental health ever yes yeah. yeah. just because i've been like allowed to do whatever like um i've sort of wanted to do so i've just spent a lot of time especially like walking through woods and by rivers and stuff like that it's just it's yeah such a that's nice important break from life that i wouldn't normally do yeah, yeah, that's that's good. That's how it should be. I've written two books, and <laughs> now my hair is going to all fall out, and I'm going to turn gray and <laughs> roll up into a little ball. But I feel pretty good about it, I guess. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's had um, diverse effects on different people, which is yeah. obviously influenced a lot by different people's personalities. Where someone who doesn't need um, the social side as much, like I, I think personally, that's myself has sort of thrived under this sort of situation yeah. when I can just like, yeah, um, learn to spend time with myself instead of other people. Yeah. Well, that was the hard thing with teaching during this and doing uh, distance learning and that kind of stuff. There were certain, certain students that I've never seen them do so well. <laughs> like I, they literally <laughs> were like flowering before my eyes. I'm like, well, I've barely talked to you and I've barely said anything, but you're making amazing work and you're doing all these great things. And then there were the, these other students that, like, you could tell that I was literally the only human contact they were having during this when I would talk to them to, for our classes. Yeah. And so it was, like, it was a lot of pressure to just suddenly be, like, their entire social network mm-hmm. was me coming through a little tiny voice call on their, yeah. on their computer or something. People need to warm up on the socially again. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll take a while to get back, back into a routine. But... Yeah. So, is the plans to open up the uh, the university again come September? Uh, I don't know. I've heard several different plans. I think there there's so many contingency plans. It's hard to know what it will actually be. I think it'll probably be a combination of several things. Like, I don't think it will open exactly the same way. Yeah. But... I have no idea how anything's going to work anymore. Like yeah. the um, just, I just life thought in general. Lockdown would be for a while, and then lockdown would end, and we'd go back to life. But yeah. I think it's going to be like very surprising if we get back to. Um, any sense of normality within like, yeah. the next year and then those jobs just aren't there for some of them too like we may go back but there may be a lot more unemployment i mean mm. there's a lot of things in pl- that are we don't know and i've never like i've never seen anything like this in my lifetime where they just agree that everything's going to be shut for however long yeah that that just is unheard of it is yeah i yesterday i was trying to find out if my um, shop was open again yeah. And then uh, I was on a website and it was a, they had a government quiz on there, not quiz, I'm um, sorry, survey question, where it like, listed what um, people thought was most important for businesses. And you voted, and I voted for keeping staff safe, and that was only 12%. At the top, oh, like, surprised. 40% was keeping the business afloat. And I was like, we live in such a like, messed up <laughs> yeah. world. Yeah. The priorities. Of priorities, yeah. yeah. It's so misplaced. I, I don't think I'm cut out for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know retail if any of us are... in general. Kind of just, like yeah, the, the <laughs> ethics of mod, modern modernity. Yeah. I know we should all live on a commune and grow our own oats or something. I guess. Yeah, I you watched Cap- watch Captain Fantastic. <laughs> no, I haven't. No, oh, that's great. That's what he does with his little family. Eagle Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> Have you seen the little um, the little commune that's been made inside of Seattle, Jared? Yeah, yeah. I, I keep getting updates that's from. I, that's where I grew up, and so I keep yeah. getting updates from people about how it's going, and it's. It seems pretty impressive. It's kind of like um, when the Occupy was still happening in New York, and everyone was just sitting there. But had the way that like they had libraries open up, mm-hmm. that they had medical 
treatments open up that they had people preparing food for people. And from what I've seen, it looks very relaxed Mm -hmm. and very positive. It's kind of nice to see something like the national news from what I've seen in America doesn't look like that. Mm -hmm. But from everyone I know who's been associated with it, it's been this kind of lovely, amazing. I was going to say, I've seen CNN and uh, Fox News and stuff try and call a call to arms to try and... Uh, to shut it all down, yeah. What, what is this? But, Sorry, I, I, I'm not um, educated on this, this matter. Um, it's just sort of a independent zone. It's kind of as if it was a giant squat, but it would be as if... It's a big section on Capitol Hill, which is historically kind of like the gay artsy center of, of Seattle. Right. And they basically... It's kind of a giant street fair where it's a protest, but it's a very chill protest. And it's kind of people trying to do without and kind of try to meet their neighbor and that kind of stuff. All right. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds very so interesting. People, kind of... were, people were protesting and they had like this like this like precinct for a police thing and then the police just decided to leave because there was too many of them, so they just sort of like took over. Yes. Yeah, the, the, now they live there. The police yeah, left because they were afraid and then I think the, the protesters boarded up the police station and it's just yeah. closed. Really? Yeah. They put walls up and stuff like that, so they're like yeah. geared it off type of thing. So it's like like a friendly zone. What, like yeah, a start of Scarface when you have that immigrant? Uh, Probably sensors. not quite like the start of Scarface, <laughs> I would think. But uh, it, it's a big water reservoir up there. So it's like a giant lake in the middle of the city. And oh, it's right, right. pretty. And it's where everyone kind of lives around. So it's just kind of... Oh, who knows? I think it's kind of interesting. That sounds very interesting. Um, <laughs> what were you laughing at? <laughs> So, Jared, do you want to talk about um, the intricacies of teaching art online and potentially? <laughs> yeah, I, I could talk about the intricacies of teaching art online. <laughs> or whether it's feasible. Is that a question? <laughs> uh, I think that. Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> I think it can be done. It was kind of hard because nobody knew it was coming. It just sort of happened. And so it was like this frantic rush to get things in place because none of it was, I mean, nobody thought the world was going to shut down for this this extended period of time. So we were kind of all just trying to get all our content online and make sure that people had access to the things that we needed. But I think that as a form, I think it could work, but it would have to be completely structured in a different way. Like it need to be a priority for people to be able to have access to it. Like, and we have students who barely have access to, to the computers they need. So that's the problem mm-hmm. with the way it is right mm-hmm. now. But if you look in America or you have like the open university and things like that here, but in America there's a, is Bard is a school outside of New York city up on, up in the Hudson river Valley in New mm-hmm. York. And they go for like, the, the students attend for a couple of weeks and then they do the rest all online and through self-work and things like that. And that's one of the top rated uh, uh, art, fine art courses in the world. It's also one of the top fine art courses in um, curatorial. So it's not really a second rate thing the way they're doing it, which is kind of nice that they, they've actually like some really important famous artists have come out of that school. So it shows that you can do that kind of a model, but you have to do it really, it has to be about the students, it has to be really some serious thinking and time invested into it. And it allows you to have more freedom. So I think it, I think it could be an amazing thing. I just think that you'd have to be very deliberate with how you do it. Mm. I think it'd work better for other um, subjects more than art. I, I, I think going to university and studying art is more of a, like an experience than... It's yeah. something um, where it's just like sort of pure education through information. Yeah. If that makes any sense. It's a lot, for me, it's a lot more about the face to face, the building of the trust of those relationships when somebody is talking about your work or you, you know whose opinion to trust and whose opinion is not going to be in the <laughs> same ballpark as where you are. Uh, it's kind of learning that sort of to be present, to be kind of a bit vulnerable with what you're working on, depending on the kind of work you're making. Yeah. And that's kind of hard to do from far away yeah I, th- I think it is you need your peers as well you need yeah people studying the same um... well the, yeah exactly it's the fair the fellow students and the crits and things like that it's just as important as what you're getting from your lecture to yeah. hear from your fellow students if the lecture may say oh this is amazing they blah 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 i love it or they may not actually get it so they give you kind of good feedback 
but your your friend's gonna say that's bullshit, and you'll know that it's bullshit if your friend says it's bullshit. It's bullshit. Yeah, I, I, so it's kind of negotiating those those aspects, and I think that's important because that's how the art world actually is. You can mm-hmm. you can kind of fool people some of the time, but you're not going to be able to in, in the real world yeah. situations. You can fool some people some of the time, but not all people all the time. <laughs> exactly. Very very well said. Good job. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, the most important thing you can get from an art degree is uh, some like is basically learning how to think, and yeah. I don't think you can that that can happen through our through sorry just like plain information. If that makes yeah, sense. I think you could do it, but it would have to be this like it would have to be a grand experiment, like, and uh, everyone would have to be very invested in it. And it, you'd be each time you did it, you'd have to be creating something for the first time. I think for it to work, right. Whereas if you try and automate, automate it, it's just going to turn into like standardized tests or something, which don't really translate for that kind of no, it definitely, mentality. No, it definitely doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, would you be okay talking about um, why you came over to England to study instead of um, staying in America? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, why did I come to, Amer- uh, to the UK from America? Uh I was ready for a change. I wanted to live someplace else. I was a bit lazy. I didn't want to have to learn French or German. Yeah, so no, that, was, that was like a plus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Michael was doing his PhD, and I was doing my PhD in Switzerland, but I could commute. Right, okay. So, okay. so I was here. And also in America, you can't get a PhD in visual art. You can get an art history. And I wasn't really interested in getting an art history degree. No, it's not, it's not what you do, is it? So. No, no. <laughs> so basically... Uh, there were some opportunities. It was also just a nice chance to go see someplace else for a while and then kind of settle down. Yeah, I can understand that because me, me and Charlie always talk about it on here, how the yeah, um, yeah. the natural progression is to go from Middlesbrough to Leeds <laughs> and then yeah, to yeah. Leeds to London. And then, <laughs> well, uh... for me, the progression was from LA and New York to <laughs> Middlesbrough, so it, it seemed to work pretty well. Oh, you went to <laughs> yeah, Lincoln you first, eh? Yeah. I went to Lincoln first, it yeah. It was a slower my, devolve then. It was my mid, uh, <laughs> Middle Ages transition to here. Yeah. Do you ever see yourself going back to the US? Uh, America, not right now. I was going to say, maybe not right in the current <laughs> yeah. climate. No, definitely not. Yeah, I miss people in America, obviously. Yeah. But right now it's a bit scary, so yeah, I'm fine I, where I, I am right now. I can understand that. But I can understand the need to also just move away to experience something new. Because I've been in Middlesbrough now for 23 years. And yeah. I could definitely do with experience in a different place. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think it's good. I think it's important to go someplace else at least for a while, and then you can come back and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Or but not. <laughs> have you noticed that in um, England, it seems to be the case that people go straight from education to education to education? Um, so basically people finish secondary school and go to college and then university and then the work Not necessarily. Afterwards. Yeah. It seems college, to be a big thing though, doesn't it's it? Legal. Yeah, yeah. It's weird to me because uh, university here is only three years. Yeah. And so I feel like like you kind of just, it's it feels like the system's very rushed to get you through it and then to keep mm-hmm. you going if they can. But it's trying to kind of rush you into this process. Whereas I did my undergrad, which was a four-year full-time. And then I took years off. I ran a gallery for a while. I ran an, an arts nonprofit organization for a while and did that kind of stuff. And then kind of got to a point where I feel felt like I couldn't get to a higher point in the things I was already doing without going and getting my master's. So I went back and got my master's. And yeah. then did my PhD pretty quickly after that, though. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. Because uh, I, I almost wish that I took a break between doing my university degree and then my master's. Yeah, I think sometimes it's good to get a little bit of world, real-world experience and to kind of grow up a little bit away from uni and then go back because you'll appreciate it more when you do your master's. Yeah, it's, it's the growing up thing that's the, the main yeah. Um, aspect. Yeah, I feel like I, I could have done with a couple more years of knowledge before yeah. I uh, finish my education. <laughs> yeah, and I don't feel like that's necessarily the priority in this country. I think it's more... I think in this country it's a bit harder to go from your undergrad and then have a life and then go back to university. I think it's it's kind of like hard to go from having a life to going back to a master's degree here. Yeah, mm-hmm. the way the funding's set up, it's that you can get the yeah. loans early on, but you can't if you you go back. So it's yeah, it's a, it's a bit stranger. It's like they yeah. almost are trying to force people to get the the um, the qualifications. It's just the way they work out the student finance. So they go off the, a wage from a year before, so if you can work at a decent wage or full time or whatever, by the time They'll you go, go off, off to of university. That. 
you lose yeah. money. Yeah, that, that, that makes absolute sense. Um, do you have anything else to promote then, Charles, on our, on our podcast? <laughs> uh, no, uh, but I do have uh, To Build a, a House That Never Ceased, which is coming out in early August of 2020. Uh, in a year, look out for, maybe a little bit longer in a year, but look out for Stalking America. That'll be out there. Oh, I also have a show at Dovetail Joint. Dovetail Joint with point. Connor. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing a, a bunch of my drawings. I'm doing them as full-size wall drawings in Ooh, the virtual space. That sounds good. Um, do, you, do you know when that gallery's opening back up again then? Really? Um, I haven't heard. I haven't been told when no. that's happening. They'll yet. have to wait for government instructions, won't they? Will, yeah, yeah. will we be able to buy your book from Amazon or will it be sold on your publishing site? Uh, it's Well, it's not through my publish. It's not me that's publishing Oh, it. no, sorry. Someone came up and quiet. I, I listened. Trust me, I did. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, yeah, it'll be on Amazon. Yeah. Or if, if I do any readings, I'll have copies as well, probably. Yeah, that, that's good. I'll borrow, I'll borrow one and I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. read free books this year. <laughs> good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's been absolutely fantastic having you on, Jared. It's been a been a pleasure yeah yeah it's good seeing you guys and talking to you it's yeah well. it, it, it is yeah I've, I've only been hanging out with like the same two people so it's yeah. nice to hear a different <laughs> voice <laughs> yeah that's always good <laughs> thank you very much yeah absolutely speak to you soon Jared. see you that was great that's great <laughs>